Hello, everyone, and welcome to Teach Me Teacher, a podcast for educators where we, the teachers, become students ourselves. I'm your host, Jacob Chastain, and today it is my privilege to bring you uh, Mr. James Whitfield, the principal at Richland Middle School, to tell us all about the principal life and everything you need to know behind the scenes as educators. All right, I just want to get straight into it. Today, we have a lot of questions to cover. I know when people talk about um, administration, sometimes they have different um, opinions about what it means to be administration, what a leader should be, all of these things. So today, uh, Mr. Whitfield, Mr. James Whitfield, one of my, uh, one, I say this on all my podcasts, it seems like, but one of my great mentors and uh, one of my teachers when I was younger. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Jacob. It's a pleasure. I'm so glad to have you here. Um, so today, what I really want to do with you, and I really wanted you on this podcast just because your leadership has taken this school to, uh, this school meaning Richland Middle School, for those of you who aren't at the school, but you have taken us to new heights. So I kind of want to get into the brain of you, kind of see what's going on in there, see what makes it all happen, the magic as they say. Um, so really, to first off, I really want you to kind of give an intro to the listeners who don't know you, maybe not know your past. Just kind of tell us, you know, where you came from, why are you a principal now, what happened to get you to this point? Definitely, definitely. Well, Jacob, thank you for having me. Um, I'm just honored that you thought enough of me to have me on the podcast. But um, your question is like, why would I want to be a principal? You know, why did I get into this? And mm -hmm. I think what, what we do in education is we have a lot of buzzwords, right? We talk about creating global citizens and how do we engage our students and uh, we need to get them this meaningful, authentic learning and all of, all of those things. Mm -hmm. And those are all great things. I think a lot of times what we do is we forget about that first we have to engage the adults in the building. And so, you know, long story short, I started out teaching and coaching at the high school level. I taught ninth grade world geography, which you know, yep. and coached basketball. And I loved what I did. I had every aspiration of being a high school basketball coach. I wanted to be the head guy. So about four years in, I went to get my master's. I said, this was before everybody had their master's, mm -hmm. you know? And so I said, what's going to set me apart from the next guy applying for that head coaching job? And so about halfway through my master's, I started looking at things through a different lens. And I started to really see that piece that was missing in that, you know, the place that I was at, there were one or two administrators that were doing that and that were engaging with me. But on a whole, there wasn't a lot of administrators that were really building those meaningful relationships with the adults in the building. I thought, well, what if every adult in the building had somebody that truly engaged them, truly pushed them, truly encouraged them uh, to do great things? and affirmed them and valued them. You know, what could that mean for the kids sitting in the classroom? So mm -hmm. that's kind of what led me to where I'm at. And like I said, you wouldn't, you couldn't have told me five years ago that this would be where I'm at now, but I truly feel like this is where I'm supposed to be and I'm living out. I think, you know, I, I think a lot of people who are teachers, you know, I'm speaking just from personal experience and who I've talked to, yeah. but we always, you know, usually people go into teaching because they want to, change the lives of kids, you know, for a variety of reasons, sure. right? You know, they, they want to do more for education. Maybe they feel a passion there, or really they want to, they see kind of where society's at and they're like, you know what? I can do my part. I can step right. in to do this. And it's interesting that you say that you almost, from what I'm hearing, it sounds like you almost feel like you could affect kids a little bit more by becoming the principal and helping the teachers help the students. Is that kind of where you're going? Right. Cause I kind of, you know, I always I, I made it a point to build relationships in my classroom because I knew how powerful that was, uh, you know, in my classroom and with my teams that I coached. But then I started, I had that aha moment, like I said, about halfway through. It's like, but how many more kids might I be able to affect if I could affect teachers, if I could impact teachers' lives and speak just speak encouragement into them and just show them really how valuable they are because, I mean, at the end of the day, the most important difference maker in a kid's life is the teacher that you have in front of them. Sure. So just empowering those individuals, I saw it as a huge opportunity to exponentially uh, affect change. Yeah. I mean, I really I really like the perspective just because it's, it's almost a... Uh... 
you know, it's taking growth mindset to almost the extreme, right? I mean, it's like, if you're going to help people, you need to go to where you can kind of affect the leaders, right? Definitely. I guess, uh, kind of coming from there. Um, so you get, you become a principal, right? Yeah. You, you're a teacher and you move up and you become a principal. What, what? What was like some of the things that were preconceived notions you might have had that changed pretty drastically, or to put it in another way, a life and a principle, right? A life as a principle. What does that mean? What does it look like? What are you doing, like in this in this office of yours? Because we know you're busy. We know you got a million things to do, but I don't think a lot of people know what the background is. So could you inform us a little bit on kind of what happens in your world? Sure. And you know, I'll tell you like this: the work, the job that I have is it's. It's awesome. I love what I do. And I think, you know, if you talk to certain people, you, you might get a different response about what it's like to be a principal, right? Sure. I know when I said, you know, about, like I said, halfway through, my mindset shifted when I was in the classroom or when I was working through my master's about what I wanted to do administration. I talked to one of my mentors and she was like, you're crazy. Don't go into administration. Like, right. don't do that. Um, but I think it's all about the lens in which you see your job as an administrator through. So if I see my job as just a guy sitting behind the desk, just pushing paperwork, just doing the compliance piece of being a principal, Mm -hmm. that is going to be miserable. Yeah. Like I'm going to hate life and (laughs) it is not going to be good. Sure. But, you know, I, I make a point to get out into the classrooms because that's where the game is being played each and every day in those classrooms. So I block out times in my schedule. Yes, there's that paper, those paperwork things that I have to do. That's a must. But, because we don't want to get in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, I have to make a point and block out those times in my schedule to get into the classroom, to make those meaningful relationships with the teachers. I need the students to see me in the hallways. I need them to see me in the classroom supporting the teachers and interested in what they're learning. And I, and I think by doing that, it just it'll create... Uh, just a culture of growth, a culture mm. of inclusivity, a culture of like, man, this 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 guy really cares about what's going on in our classrooms. Mm-hmm. And I think for the most part, what we've done as administrators is it's taken that that other lens. It's taken it's it's gone the route of, well, this is this is pushing paperwork. This is about compliance. This is about coming down on people. And I think we have a huge opportunity to really shift that and show that it's about encouraging people. It's about supporting people. It's about allowing people to take risks, uh, you know, and helping people to grow. So that's the way, that's the function of my job. I see myself as, as the uh, chief executive uh, affirmer, (laughs) you know, and just really showing people their value and what they mean. There's like this change happening in education, you know, I, and it might just be because I'm fairly new, I guess, in the realm of education, but it seems like there's this shift happening along with the shift in education because we're having, you know, they're realizing that old models are outdated. Yeah. We're starting to change the way we teach. What the classrooms we're supposed to teach are not the classrooms we grew up in. And I'm not so, even that far out of school. Right. And it's already changed drastically from what I was taught. And it seems, is that shift happening in administration too? For sure. I think more people are starting to catch on to this, this notion of really building a school culture and really building relationships. You know, that's, that's something that's inherent in me. Like, I, that's what I love to do. Mm-hmm. So it excites me to see that that's on the, the forefront and everything you'll see uh, right now in education. Everybody's talking about culture. Uh, the culture of the school and how that impacts student success. And so it excites me to see that um, because at the end of the day, if you have, if you lead with a servant's heart and you're all about doing those things to give people uh, that value, you know, that sense of what I'm doing means something to a, to a greater, uh, to a greater overall story, then I think if you do those things, People will people will run through a wall for you. They'll do anything for you mm-hmm. uh, within reason. So it excites me to see that that shift in education and how that's being highlighted. Yeah, I think it's exciting for anyone who uh, is kind of jaded by the whole educational community. And you know, we 
every episode, uh, you know, we end up hitting on something along the lines of people getting, uh, you know, older teachers kind of just tired of the system, newer teachers, they come into a system that, you know, you hear about it everywhere, right? Pick, yeah. pick your uh, news headline, right. whatever you want. Um, but this shift, the, the shift towards culture, the shift to relationships, both in administration to the staff and staff to the students, it really does seem like it's evolving. Um, but, you know, you mentioned growing your team. And staff development is one of those things, right? The whole reason this podcast exists in the first place was for me knowing that talking to people grows me more than sitting in a seminar nine times out of ten. You get stuff from seminars, and they're awesome, right. but it's when you have that application and you talk to people, you grow. For sure. So what, what's really your perspective on growing a team when it comes to staff development? What does that word mean for you, and kind of how do you approach it for your school? Yeah, so staff development, I, th- I think, has gotten a bad rap a lot because, you know, everybody hears staff development and they're thinking, okay, well, this is the next thing. Yeah. This is the next thing. And then this thing will come and then it'll be gone and we'll do something else. And I think as leaders in education, we've done that to ourselves because that's what we've allowed to happen. Mm-hmm. So anytime I look at ways to develop our staff, and what I call it is building capacity. So ways we could build capacity amongst our staff, we have to look at it. Is this something that we're going to continue? Is this something that we can that's going to be worth the time and energy that we're going to put into it? And how my number one question when a staff development opportunity or a capacity building opportunity comes to me is how are we going to sustain it? Because if there's one thing that wears a teacher out is that here we go. Here's a new thing. Yeah. We're going to do it for a couple months. And then when it doesn't work, which is crazy because we know always there's issues, right? Yeah. Uh, but when it doesn't work, we just scrap the whole thing and we start with something new. Instead, if we begin with that in mind, okay, how are we going to build capacity amongst our staff? Okay, this is, this is what we see we need. We need training on differentiation. Okay, well, when we bring in that training and there are certain aspects that don't work, what are we going to do? to go back and tweak it and fix it. And just if you if you lead with that, then staff knows that it doesn't have to be perfect as we roll it out. There's gonna be things that need to be changed and tweaked. Uh, but I think that's the most important thing when looking at, okay, what are we gonna do as a, as a staff to build that capacity? Because any, in any organization, if you're not growing your people, there's no way that the, the people in the uh, in this administrative suite can do everything that mm-hmm. needs to be done on the campus. You have to be able to to build that capacity amongst teachers. That's why I feel so blessed to be where I'm at at this school because we have so many teachers that are, that are already looking for those opportunities. So uh, it's not that I have to go out and find different things. For instance, you came to me <laughs> with this idea, like, hey, I've got this great idea about a podcast, right. you know, and it's like, Okay, well, Jake, what can I do to support you? <laughs> right. You know, I'm here for you. And so, um, you know, I just think that's that's awesome that you, you you build that capacity amongst teachers and then they come and they start thinking of ways to build themselves. Is that scary? Having, like, almost, like, you're relinquishing power to a, a certain degree, it seems like. You're like, here you go. You know, I support you guys. You know, y'all are the, y'all are doing the research. You're finding these things. Well, the thing is, you know, I I want staff to trust me. And so I think with that, that begins with me trusting them. So I need to trust that the educator in the room knows what they need to grow. Mm -hmm. Now, will there be people that that need me to kind of guide what that is? (laughs) You know, yes, of course. But I think what we do is we kind of, take this this broad approach that everybody needs training on uh, let's just say workshop and everybody's going to do workshop training Mm -hmm. well not everybody needs the workshop training some people do some people don't and I think where we're going is really differentiating that uh, that professional learning you know we we preach for teachers to differentiate learning for students. Yeah. But then at, oftentimes as administrators, we say, well, 
everybody, we're going to do this training because everybody needs it. Well, that's not, that's not reality. That's not the way the world works. So if we're going to preach that, then we need to show that in, in the way we lead, in the way we offer opportunities for, for teachers to grow. Now, if it's something, if we see a teacher going off the, re, off the reservation and they're just doing, <laughs> just, you know, they're doing PD on, uh, you know, just breathing techniques where kids are going to pass out, you know, <laughs> sure, sure. Okay. We're going to really, we're going to bring that back in, <laughs> you know, and we're going to help guide them along towards something. But, you know, I think by and large, teachers want to do a good job and they know the areas that they need work. And so I think we need to trust them that they'll make the decisions that are best uh, to impact their classroom. I mean, that's a pretty liberating idea, speci specifically for an educator. Like when I hear that, uh, that's like, you know, that has to connect to my love language somewhere because it's um, having the freedom, you know, as a professional to self-analyze sure. and and grow i think that's something that doesn't exist especially from i mean a lot of teachers come from the corporate world like a lot of people don't start off teaching correct there are some people that just jump straight in right. but you know you go to the corporate world you know you have you know you, you sit at the computer they train you you might go to you know uh training from your manager or whatever but you have these there's almost this society mindset i guess to where it's top-down approach to where they're like you need to learn this this is what you need to be successful if you don't do it there's a compliance issue Right. And you get into this field of education and it's almost like there's so much research and there's so much to do and there's so much that doesn't mesh with your personality, right? I mean, right. how, I mean, when you were a teacher, did you ever have a training that you were like, you know what, I can't pull this off the way, you know, Susie down the hallway does it, but I can alter it or make it mine or something like that. Did you ever have that Definitely. experience? There's, there's always, there's always things that come up and off the top of my head, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to think. I mean, there was numerous trainings that I sat in. Yeah. And I was I was there physically, <laughs> but I was completely checked out um, because, you know, for instance, some of those were on uh, relationship building and how to build, how to team build and class build and mm -hmm. those kind of. Well, you know, quite quite honestly, I felt like I was pretty good in those areas. There were some other areas that I that I needed growth, and if I would have had that flexibility to go out and find something that was more uh, respectful of my time. Sure. You know, and, and really look at myself as a teacher and, what, okay, what do I need to grow in rather than sitting in this training for three days that I'm, I, I felt like I was pretty proficient in. Um, not perfect, but proficient. And, you know, so I felt like there was opportunities for me to do other things. And so... Are there those things that are a, a campus-wide initiative that we need to we have to all be a part of? Yes. How do you make that distinction? Well, I think when you make that distinction, you have to look at what, on a whole, on a campus, when you look at your needs assessment, you see the areas that's uh, that's of greatest need on your campus. For instance, here at Richland Middle School, we have a high ELL population. Mm -hmm. So, uh, no matter where you're at in the building, you're going to have a student that needs uh, sheltered instruction. So it's important for our whole campus uh, to have the elements of PSYOP implemented in their classroom in some way or, or another, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, but for more of like the GT, say for a GT differentiation, you know, we, we might need for our, our pre-AP te teachers to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, not necessarily yeah. all of our on-level teachers to have to do that. Um, give them a training in something else that would be more beneficial and more, you know, respectful of their time, you know, in that. So it's just a matter of looking at the needs of the campus and seeing, okay, what do we all need? And then you can take it down to that next level and say, okay, well, what? find something that you need in your classroom. Are those needs, uh, when you when you identify a need, when you're looking for them, is it, are you looking at the data, like testing data, or are you looking at when you walk into people's rooms? Is it a combination? How does that look like? It's, it's a combination, really. I think overall, when you're looking at the big picture of a campus, you're looking at the hard data. So you're looking at star data. You're looking at the telpos data mm -hmm. and seeing where, where the students are at. Um, but then other issues that are you know maybe not um, as formal data-driven, for instance, the, the culture and climate of the campus, uh, you know, when you 
sometimes you won't have everybody on campus. People say, oh, do a survey. Well, you won't have everybody yeah. on the campus complete the survey. So, sure. you know, what happens if a third of them don't do it? Well, you've missed a third that might have really impacted that data. But I think just going around the campus and capturing the feel of, you know, okay, well, how does it feel when I'm in this space? You know, that can help guide your thinking as far as what, okay, what do we need in turn to, to grow to grow our campus culturally? So some of it is hard data. Some of it is just that antidotal data. Yeah. You know, to look at and say, okay, what is it that we need? A lot of teachers are sitting here and they're like, get to observations, get to observations, because they know it makes them nervous. A lot of them, uh, you know, they get stressed out about being observed. Right. An, an administrator walks in, and I don't know what it is about teachers' brains. Maybe it's because we're creative people. But we're like, what's he doing? You know, he just he looked at my wall, and he wrote down something. You know, you, all the little things, and it, it messes up. It doesn't mess up the lesson, but, you know, you start acting differently just because there's – especially when you could walk in or a principal walks in with – other people that we might not know their faces of, but <laughs> right. they're wearing suits and they got clipboards and all this other stuff. So what it, what does it mean when you're walking in uh, a classroom? What, what's the principal doing? Thanks for asking. You know, I'm really big on getting into classrooms um, so that it's not an oddity when I enter your classroom. I think a lot of times where it becomes this awkward situation that we're scared is when that person walks in and it's like the end of the year and you've not seen this person <laughs> All year long, yeah. and so of course your mind is going to go straight to okay, what you know, what am I going to be non-renewed? Sure, <laughs> you know, what is going on because they haven't been in here all year long. Now they're in here, um, so I, I'm really big on getting into the classrooms because I want to be visible for the students. I want the students to see me and see how I'm supporting that teacher. Uh, I want I want to be able to build relationships with the students in there. I want to be able to build relationship with the teachers so they know that when I come in. Um, it, there's, it's non-threatening. This is just me uh, offering myself up as an extra person in the room to give you feedback, to, sh to celebrate the things you're doing great, and offer suggestions on, you know, things that maybe you can work on. But, you know, it is, it's my hope that when, pe when, when I walk in that, that people know that I'm there to support them. And it's my hope that I've done a good enough job as an administrator building those relationships with the teachers so that they know if Whitfield's in here, like we need to, we need to celebrate that. You know, he's mm -hmm. he's coming in. He's he's going to be here of, of support, and you know he's going to find a way uh, to show me some things that maybe I can work on to take my game to the next level. And so that's what I really really hope for when I come into the classroom. That's hopefully that eases some tensions from people because I know I you know I've had the conversations just you know with other teachers and they're like oh you know. What, what I, I, he came into my room? Did he come in your room? Or you know, it's just like you get the the little whispers, and if there's this anxiety comes up because you're. I mean, you are watching, definitely. So it's. But I, I think I, here's the here's the thing. I think it like you said early on. It's human nature for us to be anxious when somebody uh, comes into our space, right? And I think that comes from our our desire to do a great job. Mm -hmm. And so it's not, it's not a natural, um, you know, I have the same thing when my supervisor comes here on campus, you know, I'm just like, you know, I'm glad they're here, but I'm just like, okay, let me, I want to show them some great things that are going on. I want to be, I want to show right. that I'm doing a good job. So, you know, I totally get it. And, you know, no matter what the relationship is, you know, you can have the strongest of relationships. There's going to, there's going to be that sense of, I want to do a good job, you know, mm -hmm. while the person's in here, that's going to give a little bit of angst. But it's my hope that, like I say, I've built that relationship as such that it lowers that a little bit. Not yeah. to say that it won't, it won't be there, but it takes it down to where they know the heart of why I'm in their room. And it's not, I'm not there as a gotcha. I'm not there to say, ah, ah you don't have that, oh, that objective. <laughs> that objective, you didn't have that up there, you know, because you might have just erased it to do something, do something else up there. Yeah. That's, that's not the why. Uh, the why is just to be a support to you and show you know help grow you, uh, build that capacity as an educator. I think that as you were talking, I think you hit on something that's pretty uh, that should be stated, which is I think when teachers are nervous when administration or district people walk in, 
they're nervous because they want to prove how awesome they're doing, Absolutely. right? And they want to be like, my kids are learning and stuff like that. Yeah. And the I think the worst fear of any teacher that's being observed at any point in time is this is going to be the day Johnny flips off Susie across the oh, room. Oh, for sure. Or, you know, or they're going to flip off me. You know, something's going to happen. Right. And, that's, and sometimes it does. I've had moments where I've had administration, I remember my first year, um, my principal, you know, she was observing me and the lesson couldn't have gotten any worse. It was something new I was doing. Uh, it was one of my big classes. It was a pre-AP class. So all the kids, you know, were super smart and they all knew what they were supposed to be doing. But it was just, I mean, it was chaos for like 25 minutes. Yeah. And I was like, you know, I was just sitting there and you know, she just, she was just observing because, it, you, know, you know, it's funny, it didn't end bad because it was, one, I was a new teacher, but I walked out of there and I, when we had the conversation uh, together, it was a it was a building it was a growth conversation right. and you know I wasn't under any illusions that that lesson went well yeah. right like right, I didn't right, walk right. out of there going <laughs> what it was I know it's bad let's talk about it and I think that's you know it's hard to accept feedback but feedback is the thing you know we just came back from a personal training where one of the things she talked about was give feedback. For sure. And I don't want to be cryptic to those of you listening. You know, anyone who was at the school, you know, went to this Capturing Kids Hearts, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but it, it was, they, she did. She talked about getting feedback from your spouse, from administration, from teachers, from everyone. Like how, when you think of feedback, and you, when, because you have to give it, right? <laughs> you know, you write it, we get it on our little notes in the computer, and we have our meetings with you. What, what do you, when you're writing those, what's kind of going through your head onto what to hit on? How to, how to present the information, if that question makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Well, you know, one thing that really stands out to me about feedback, and, of course, that's a that's a big word, timely feedback, right? Mm-hmm. Everybody, you know, it's big on giving. Give people timely feedback on how they've done. But the thing about feedback is it's only as valuable as the person giving it. So if you don't have a relationship with that person, your feedback just went in the trash. Yeah. You know, no matter how well it's written, it's just, it's going to go in the trash. So, again, I know I've said this before, I'll say it again. The feedback is only as valuable as the person that you have that relationship with, That, that as strong as that relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, it's important when you're giving feedback that you're very specific. You know, it's not generalized, hey, good job on that, on that <laughs> lesson. Oh, okay, what was good about it? <laughs> right. You, you know? Um, it could have been your probing questions. You know, you, you ask some really good probing questions as in da, 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 you know, and really being specific about the feedback that you're giving teachers because I think most teachers love feedback because they want, they're in this business because they love it, right? Yeah. And they want to do a great job. And there's nothing more frustrating, and this I, I can say this from personal experience in the classroom, than getting those appraisals back and it says, great job or just a box checked that's not that's not feedback that doesn't help help us grow Um, so I'm very intentional about the wording that I that I use when I'm giving feedback to teachers making sure that it's very specific and making sure that I get it get it back to them in a timely manner it could be it, it might not be as formal as something in the computer it could be a sticky note that I fill out before I leave the classroom and stick it on the desk you know about you know their exit ticket or you know the way they implemented uh, technology into into their lesson and how that extended the work. I mean, it could, but it's going to be very specific mm-hmm. about what went on in that classroom. I kind of want to take a step into the this word research, mm-hmm. um, just because I it's, I think it's invaluable in education that people do their research because it's always sure. changing. I mean, the stuff that they were saying, you know, a decade ago are definitely not true today. And the stuff they said last year is changing this year. So from an administration standpoint, you know, and this build, this connects to kind of building your staff and building your school and stuff. How important is it for people to do the research? In your perspective, how, like, when it comes to teachers doing it and your administration and even yourself, like, what, what's the value you put on that? It's huge. I mean, if you're not if you're not researching, if you're not looking for ways to improve your craft, no matter what that is, whether it's leadership, uh, whether it's relationship building, whether it's uh, being a social studies teacher, ELA teacher, if you're not looking for 
best practices that are out there to improve your craft, you're standing still. And in today's world of education, I mean, what even what we did five years ago, um, there's so much information out there for our students. They don't need us to be the same teachers we were five years ago. Mm-hmm. They need us preparing them for something even bigger. And what's scary about that is that we don't even we don't know what that is. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like I can't remember a time in history that that's been something that that people have said because we we've been under this tr- traditional model of education. Mm-hmm. Students are all in rows. Everybody's getting the cookie cutter education. Now we're talking about personalized learning environments, blending learning. What in the world is that? Yeah. How am I supposed to turn over the learning to the kids? I'm the teacher. Right. You know, I'm and so it's just this it's blowing people's mind. But if we stay up on the research and we research best practices and how we do those things and how we roll those out, you know, it becomes easier. It's when we don't and we stand still that we become archaic in our ways and we really don't prepare our students for uh, what they're going to have to do in the future. The word I keep thinking about while we're having this conversation is like the word power because it's there's a power shift that's kind of going on and it's it's been going on but it's you know right now you know it you know at least at our school I see it a lot to where we're really striving to look at that word and what I mean by that is you you mentioned is you know give the the students the power over their learning for sure and that's one that's a revolutionary concept because you're like why why can't they why can't they be in charge of where this conversation goes why can't they guide you know based on their inquiries right rather than following this guideline that of this novel study right right right. let them guide you know where they're coming from and that's I, i think that scares a lot of people like if i was administration who specifically has been in administration for a few years or even decades in some cases i think i'd be terrified of my teachers like changing and flipping so, I mean, is that, do you have those conversations like at, you know, principal meetings or, you know, uh, district meetings or whatever? Do you, like, is that stuff happening in the district where y'all are having those conversations about this environment changing? Yeah, definitely. And, you know, our district was just awarded the Raise Your Hand Texas Blended Learning Grant. We were whoop, one whoop. of the five uh, finalists for that. And so... One of the great things about being in this district is we've we're already seeing that as a district that this is the way education's going. Mm-hmm. So I'm really excited. You know, it takes it takes a little bit of that angst and you know anxiousness away uh, because the district is on board with it. Something that I I feel is very important uh, towards our students learning to self monitor, learning to hold themselves accountable for their own learning. That's where that's that's where education is going. It's no longer the teacher being this dispenser of knowledge that stands up in front of a room. Right. You know, the, the, the students have to take ownership in their learning. And when they do, test scores rise. You know, their their emotional capital rises because they have something that they're proud of. And so it's it's just exciting for me to see that going on on a district level. And so it makes it that much easier for me to come back and, and turn turn the keys, hand over the keys, so to speak, to the teachers and say, hey, you know, this is where we're going. Let me know what you what you need from me to make that happen, and let's do it. Let's let's do it for our kids. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it is super powerful. I can't shout out to uh, Birdville ISD yeah. just because definitely uh, you know it's the school system that brought me up all the way, and it's now working in it. Like I couldn't imagine doing anything else with any other district. Yeah. So kudos and shout out to anyone who's listening in district. Richland Middle School, our school, our home campus, our lovely Rams. We, uh, over you know the past years, um, discipline has been the hot button issue at our campus. And I imagine it's a hot button issue at a lot of campuses. Oh, yeah. I've never worked at another campus, but the, you know I just imagine. Um, but discipline, it's it's the thing. I feel like I hear that word more often than not. We're like, what are our rules? You know, a lot of our professional development has been centered around how to rein in uh, disciplinary issues, um, how to build culture along with that, right? Not just punishing bad behavior, but changing behavior. For sure. Um, 
as administration, you guys see so much. And we're going to talk about this when we definitely hit on the assistant principal episode that's coming on Teach Me Teacher. But, you know, you guys, y'all, you know, when we are dealing with them in the classroom, you know, we're dealing with so much stuff. The discipline, you know, we are disciplined in the classroom. We're doing things like that. But you guys see a lot. You know, you see the referrals and you look at the data and you see these behavior things and y'all really deal with the back end. And the question I'm kind of leading up to is, you know, how what's what's your approach and this administration's approach to discipline at a school and how that relates to uh, changing the culture, right? Not just punishing behavior, but changing behavior. What's, what's your outlook on that? For sure. So, you know, I think one of the things that we have to always keep in mind when there is any disciplinary issues is that root cause of that behavior. Mm-hmm. So anytime there's a kid's acting out in your class, it, it's not necessarily because that's what that student woke up and wanted to do that day. There's all there's a there's a root cause. Are there those kids that hey, they just wake up and they're just jerks? Yeah, of course. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, most students want to come to school and and do a good job. So, I think when things happen, we have to always dig down to the root. And I think when we don't get to that root cause of why this behavior played out, uh, we do the kid a disservice. We do the teachers a dis- disservice. So we, we really hone in on, okay, what is going on? Why did this happen? No, we're not letting you off the hook for doing what you did. Mm-hmm. We're going to love on you. We want to build that relationship. But at the same time, we want to know, you know, why that took place. You're going to be held accountable, but we need to know why so we can help you so this doesn't happen again. And so we've really focused a lot of our, th- I th- I'm, a, I'm a firm believer in you get what you focus on. So if we're constantly fo- focusing on the negative things that are happening uh, with certain students, because, you know, overall, it's less than 3% of our students that give the bulk of your disciplinary load. An important thing to remember. Yes. So, I mean, it's a very low number that's giving you the bulk of your discipline. So, are we going to focus all of our attention and efforts on that low number of kids that are, yeah, we're going to love, like I said, we're going to love on them. We're going to give them some, um, we're going to try to help them move forward. We're going to let them work with our student assistance counselor to see what, what deeper issues are there. Yeah. But what are we doing for all these other kids that are behaving the way they should? They're taking care of their business in the classroom, you know? So one of the things we do, we, we make phone calls home every every six weeks to every A honor roll student, every A B honor roll student. I take all the A honor roll students, I call each one of their houses and tell their parents how proud we are of their student. I mean, some of those parents are in tears because they've never heard from a principal. And I mm-hmm. think that's a travesty. Yeah. Because Johnny, who gets in trouble every day, he gets a call <laughs> from an administrator, mm-hmm. you know, it, a couple times a week. So why not this kid that's knocking it out of the park and doing exactly what he's supposed to do? So I feel like, you know, that's the least we can do as administration. Let's focus on some of those, the kids that are doing what they're supposed to do. So we've got some other incentives that we're going to be rolling out uh, this year that I'm excited about uh, for kids that are just taking care of their business. We need to, we need to make sure we're focusing on that. I think, I'm, I firmly believe that when we do that, a lot of these, the students that are, we're going to be able to pull out some of those students that have been habitually exhibiting those negative behaviors into the majority. Yeah, there was, I went to Kagan training uh, my first year, and it was life-changing in a lot of ways. Um, but I remember the speaker, uh, one of the days, he said something that has stuck with me ever since. And I was like, you know, I, get, I always get like one phrase or two phrases from trainings I go to. But the, the one of the phrases, he said, a student misbehaving is only showing a need. Mm-hmm. And like I was – that struck me because it, I, it's so true. Because sure. you, why, you know, the they, – they could be having anxiety, fear. You don't know what's happening in their home life. It could be something in their brain even chemically. It could be a million different things. But what you know – is that they're showing you a need for something. Right. And when and sometimes they sometimes that need is attention. And this the reason I'm connecting these two ideas is because what you said about drawing out the good behaviors, rewarding the good behaviors, affirming for the sure. good behaviors, that 
Uh, in a lot of ways, those kids that get the negative phone calls, they get the calls home. That's what they're seeking. Attention. They want the attention. Right. And if they, and you know, this isn't conscious, you know, 99% of the time, but they have that need for mom or dad or the teacher or the principal, whoever, to give them that attention. And I think as teachers and administration, a lot of the time we do weigh on that. It's, you know, it's human nature to focus on the negative. For sure. But it's destructive, it you know, is. in an educational environment because that's what you're rewarding. And that's what, if you focus on that negative, you're going to see more of that. Absolutely. And I've, I've had classrooms. You know, where it's like that was the focus, was the negative, and you, it devolves quickly. And that, so what, you know, you, you briefly teased our listeners with some incentives. And I, I don't want you to go into too much detail because I know you got some secrets, but what's some things that you could give us that, you know, for people that might not be experiencing it this year to someone that might get some ideas about what we're doing here? Yeah, definitely. Uh, well, one of the things for our eighth graders, we're going to have what's called trust cards. Um, and basically, Every student on campus that's in the eighth grade is going to have this. And it's basically a, a show of trust from the educators in the building to the students in the building. Um, and there's going to be random incentives for students that have those cards that don't get them, we're not saying taken away, but rather forfeited because we're putting it on them to take care of their business. And if they don't, they have to forfeit their card and they have to go back and they have to make amends for what they did before they get it back. Mm -hmm. um, but there'll be random acts of kindness for those students. Uh, we're going to do some things uh, throughout the building and at lunchtime for students that are uh, what we call RAM greats. Uh, that's students that are uh, doing the best they can in class, not necessarily your A, B honor roll or A honor roll students because you've got some kids that they're giving it all they can and they pulled out a C. Mm -hmm. And that's great. Yeah. And now we'll work on getting you to a B. So we need a so I was really big on having it, they have to be students doing the best they can, they're coming to class, and their, their behavior is good mm -hmm. or improving. It could be a student that had some issues, but they're improving. So teachers will nominate those students, and we'll have some incentives for uh, those students by six weeks. Um, we're doing some things for attendance, uh, gift cards and, and such. We're going to have... Uh, alternate days, you know, we're at, well, not alternate days, but uh, kind of flexible days to where maybe at the end of end of the day, if your name is called because you've been seen to show uh, random acts of kindness to your, your classmates, you're going to get out 10, 15 minutes early and we're going to do something special for you. Um, you might get to leave five minutes early to get down to the lunch line. You know, those kind yeah. of things, just things that don't really cost a whole lot, uh, but mean a whole lot to a kid yeah no i this is it's all awesome because it's the you know how, how many times have we talked to a kid and like why why would i do this i, I mean there's no reason why i should right. pass there's no reason because there's no reward right right and that that's I'm never going to be on the a on a roll so you know whatever yeah and that's <laughs> i i do think that's that's some powerful stuff so hopefully uh someone listening uh who is in a position or you know it you know, teachers whoever get those ideas and really start implementing them and what's important to note you bring up a good point there is that a lot of the, a lot of the things that I'm talking about is teacher created you know you know we sat down as a, as a team myself one of the assistant principals and several teachers and kind of we've we've come up with this you mm -hmm. know so you know it's not that I just had all these ideas <laughs> in my brain that just came out you know it's all about building that capacity and giving people opportunities to show their strengths in areas and we've had a um, a couple of teachers shout out to elizabeth kelly Whoop. and melissa ha <laughs> um, <laughs> who have met a lot over the summer to really put some of these things on the table for our students for next year and i think it's going to really make a, a huge positive impact on our campus so this actually this segues perfectly into uh, collaboration and kind of what that means um, because I feel like you know well actually I don't feel like I know that when I collaborate even though you know in my head you know I have these ideas for these lessons and I'm like this is great this is gonna work perfect for me right. once I bring it to someone they find holes in it or they add something to it or something something happens in that conversation 
to create a deeper lesson or a deeper understanding of what I'm trying to do, right? Right. And it's kind of getting outside of your own echo chamber. Definitely. Um, when you are approaching stuff, and you know, you mentioned it just now that you, you know, you used your teachers, you talked to people, you kind of created a collaborative team. Do you, and you've at our campus, it seems like you've created several mini teams within <laughs> greater teams. Is that kind of a part of your philosophy, or what? What's causing you to break these teams up? What's about the brainchild behind that? Well, in each one of us, there's this need to be part of something. Okay, and yeah, we're all part of this Richland Middle community, right? Right. We're all part of that. But um, we all have this need to be part of something a little more intimate. And so my my big thing is I want people to feel connected. And so connectedness is going to come from those small collaborative groups working on specific tasks. So we have groups that are going to be, that, that meet on specific specific things, and that allows... For okay, yeah, we're we're part of this this overall team, but we've got these uh, small cohesive groups uh, that people just get that that sense of like a, a closer belonging, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. Yeah, so uh, that's that's really cool. Just because, um, I mean, you are it's all it's you're taking like these people and you're breaking them up into small teams. You know, a lot like a classroom. Yeah, to where the class is a whole unit. And then you break them up into groups, and those groups, you know, work on different levels, but they all end up kind of creating their own things. You know, that's the whole reason give them, the students they're learning, For sure. is they all give you, together they're going to give you better ideas than alone. So I guess you're just practicing what teachers are asked to practice. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that's one of the things that really put us behind the eight ball as administrators is that we weren't we weren't doing a lot of the things that we were asking teachers to do in the classroom, mm-hmm. and so I think we need to be models of that. You know, if we're going to ask teachers to differentiate in the class, well, we need to differentiate pro- <laughs> uh, professional learning. Right. You know, if we're going to say, you know, uh, we need hey create these high performing small groups in your in your classroom, well, we need to do the same thing from the campus level. You know, and looking at the different needs on the campus and making sure that. Everybody has their their place to fit in or an opportunity to fit in uh, to some kind of group to feel connected. Yeah. You know, what would you tell a teacher when it comes to dealing with administration, whether they got a problem with them, whether they want to grow more, you know, anything like that, just from a principal's perspective to their teacher, what would you kind of tell them? So... You know, a teacher that's that's looking for a way to approach their their principal is that what you're asking? Yeah, just from you know the the principal's perspective, you know, what what should a teacher know when it comes to going to talk to administration? Well, f- for me personally, I I always want teachers to come to me with what they need. Um, I want them to share their thoughts, um, you know, their ideas, you know, what kind of things they would like to try in their classroom. I want them free to take risks. So I want them to come to me. So, you know, like I said, one of the things I'm really intentional on building relationships with with the staff, getting in their classrooms, checking on them before or after school, popping in, how you doing, those kind of things. And um, some people may have that in their building. Some people may not. And so for the people that have that, well, you already know. Just go, go to your administrator and let them know what you need. For those of you that may not have that, um, I would encourage you to take it upon yourself um, to build that relational capacity with with your administrator. It might take you stepping out of your comfort zone um, and building that relationship. That person may not be strong in that that respect. They may be very very strong in breaking down data mm-hmm. and you know the academic piece of of education, but they might not be very strong in uh, relational capacity. So um, that may be something that you just have to step out of your comfort zone and really work hard on building that relationship with your administrator so that when it's time to go to them with, with things, um, that they're receptive. Uh, but if you have ideas, if you have things that you know are going to be great for students, just think of it in this respect. If you know it's going to be something great for students, then you're doing, and you don't go to that administrator with that idea, then you're doing your students a disservice. So if you have a great idea, um, you, 
you sort of owe it to your students to get in there and, and advocate for that, um, especially if it's something that you've researched and you know that this is something that could be a game changer for our kids. So you're the biggest advocate for our kids outside of their outside of their households, and sometimes even you know with their households yeah. uh, because some may not have that at at home. So make sure that you you advocate for what you need, whether you have it great and you have a principal or administrator that welcomes everything or you have one that's that's semi-closed off or closed off um, you just owe it to them to go and advocate f for what you want and what you need for your kids for those of you listening who are you know from the rms campus we got a special message coming up at the end of this podcast so stick around for after the the ending music and James is going to give you a special message. Uh, and, you know, if you're not from RMS, you can stick around and listen to what he has to say. Um, but I do want to leave everyone with, uh, you know, go to teachmeteacherpodcast.com. Uh, look around the website. Comment on it. Give us some feedback. Go to the Facebook page. Hit that like button. Uh, we're always posting stuff on the Facebook page. Growing the community. Uh, so remember, just keep up with us. Thank you for listening to this episode. Uh, it was my pleasure to have James here talking to us. Uh, my pleasure, my man. Yeah, Thanks I, for having me. <laughs> um, so, yes, anyone listening, remember, share this with your team. Have a good one. All right, so we are here, you know, RMS, with our, our leader, Mr. James Whitfield. I wanted him to kind of just... Uh, you know, share some words. I know he wanted to share some words for this kind of this moment for him being on the on on the podcast. So I'm gonna give him the floor. Uh, this is him talking to you guys. Hey guys. So as we went about our business last year, you know, I could not be more proud of you, and just the way you embraced me as a rookie principal and just supported me, and you had my back, and you know, I'll be forever grateful uh, for what you you did for me and the way you eased any anxiety or pressure that that I felt uh, coming in. You know, I hope you had an awesome opportunity this summer to recharge your batteries and get rejuvenated and get ready for this next school year. I'm extremely excited for the work that we're going to do this year and all the things that we have in place. Uh, it is going to be a truly magical year. You know, as always, I want you to really uh, think about who you are and what you're about and just the impact that you have each day in the lives of kids. Um, you're asked to do so much more than, than what you really should. You know, you're asked to cover so many of society's uh, ills, but you do so with such a big heart and loving heart, and you just, you go in, you go into the fire for our kids each and every day. So I just want you to know from me to you how much I appreciate that, how much I truly appreciate that, how much I love you, how much I care about you, and uh, that you are the difference makers uh, in these kids' lives, and you're impacting uh, generations in what you do. So, you know, as we go into this year, you're going to hear a message on Monday uh, from Dr. Nate Hearn that's going to be talking about your legacy. And, you know, last year we started with your why, you know, why you do what you do. What is your, what is your driving force? And I kind of shared with you what mine was, and you all shared with each other. And I felt like uh, last year was unbelievable. It was, we did things beyond my my high, highest of expectations. Um, so as we go into this year, we have a chance to take that even a step further. So think about what the legacy is that you want to leave for the students that have crossed your classroom because you're leaving one whether you know it or not. Uh, you are leaving that, you're leaving that legacy. And so you're going to have kids that are going to come back to you uh, years after they've left your classroom. And it's going to be some of the kids that you maybe thought, weren't listening to you at all, and you've made a huge impact on in their lives. So at the forefront of our thinking moving forward this year, just think about the legacy that you're leaving, um, you know, on these on these kids and about the work that you do. So I just want to thank you in advance for everything that you do for the for the community. Uh, you spend more time at this school than you do with with your families for the most part, and I'm just so thankful to have you as part of our RMS family. Let's get it going. I'm excited to be here with you, and let's do it. Go Rams! Yes, sir.